everybody, and welcome again to another episode of The Risk Matrix with James Junkin and myself, Dr. Martin. And today we've got a really special guest on The Risk Matrix, Shane Oliver. Welcome, Shane. Good morning, everybody. Shane and, and uh, James and I are going to talk about boots on the ground field safety today. But before we get into that and uh, we roll you on into the matrix there, Shane, I'm going to give a little shout out to our sponsor, Site Docs. Today's workplace safety is filled with complex hazards and risks. Maintaining a safe workplace using paper or inadequate software is time consuming and potentially unreliable. Today, over 3,000 plus companies use Site Docs safety management software to help streamline safety operations with digital forms, ensuring compliance with real-time monitoring, saving valuable time, money, and lives. Trusted by companies large and small, from startups to multinational corporations, SiteDocs has the highest standards of security and comprehensive safety solutions. To learn more about SiteDocs and exclusive offers for Veriforce Network members, visit veriforcenetwork.com slash offers slash site docs uh and again uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna hand it over to james junkin but we got shane oliver here and, and we're gonna we're gonna have a good discussion today uh, i'm real excited about this because shane oliver is one of the top boots on the ground not don't beat around the bush let's get workers home safe from high hazard jobs safety professionals that that i know so welcome to the show, Shane. You're in the matrix, baby. Thanks, James. I appreciate that. I don't know if I'm going to introduce myself as a top person, but I appreciate <laughs> that. There you well, go. We, both, we both have great regard for you, Shane. And you know, um, way back in the day that you and I met through um, some mutual colleagues, and um, I've been following your career. Uh, we've become personal friends, uh, just like James and I have become personal friends. And, uh, you know, James and I were you know, noodling around the other day, who to have on the show to talk about what it's really, really like um, for safety professionals that are doing, um, you know, high hazard work, number one, uh, but really out in the field every day. So um, thanks for doing this for us. And uh, James, sure. you, can, you can lead off with, with Shane. You know, Shane, as, as, as people listen to this show, they sort of identify with, with, how how we go about implementing a safety management system and and from the framework of safety the paper side of safety the the management system side of safety and and i think dr martin and i are are pretty well read and and educated in that respect but oftentimes there's a disconnect between the people who are planning the work and the folks actually doing the work and you're there with the people doing the work. What are we getting right, bro? And what are we getting wrong in trying to bring workers home safe from high hazard jobs? I think uh, I think I would like to start with first of all, you guys open this up with a with a sponsor, Site Docs. I've personally never used Site Docs, uh, but one of the things that I'm seeing out in the field is there's some of these programs are getting to be a dime a dozen. There's a lot of them. And each one of them costs a different price. Each one of them has a different functionality. Uh, I'm seeing a bunch of them that are maybe they're originally steered towards one particular industry. And to keep up with competition, they're having to open the open the windows up, I guess, if you want to say that, to accommodate for more of the industries, more of the, the different types of job sites, whether it's construction or, uh, you know, manufacturing process or, you know, lots of other lots of other industries and when that happens you get at the corporate level these salesmen and stuff will go to a, a all these different conventions whether it's assp or national safety council or whatever it is they go to all these different conventions uh, marketing their brand marketing the company and while you're there there's going to be an exhibitor there with some brand new state-of-the-art new company whether it's an ehs housing management system or whatever it is and we're starting to see more and more of these things flood into the market. Uh, I think it's a good thing. I was just visiting with a company this week and they're still doing everything on spreadsheets. It's mm. uh, it's very redundant, but it's effective. And if you think about the algorithms behind some of these applications, it all comes from Excel uh, in some way or another. It all comes from Excel. Um, 
so there's some companies out there that I guess it, their system works with Excel and it's fine, but not everybody in the field knows how to use Excel. I, I would call myself uh, maybe a little more than novice getting closer to intermediate level user of Excel, but I'm certainly not an advanced user of Excel, but uh, so the so, systems is, I think these systems is one thing we're doing right. It's, it can gather analytics, but it's also one of the things we're doing wrong. Um, because there's so many different ones, these companies get lost into spending a whole bunch of money. They give it a couple of years and come to find out it wasn't the best. And then they go spend some more money on another one. And sometimes these companies go through several of them. And, and it seems like the end user is us in the field. And just when you start getting used to something, then they change it and it becomes more complicated. And overall, if you do that over the spread of a, a five or 10 year period, people just give up on the software. And yeah. it's really is, it is the one thing that we're doing well, but it's also the one thing that's just flooded the market that's causing hindrance, I think. So, so that kind of, that kind of leads me, Shane, I'm as I'm listening to you talk about this, you know, con continu continuity is a big thing, right? right. And I, I guess what, what, what that leads me to, to ask is, um, I know you, you've done, you know, some contract work in the past. Um, I mean, we're not having continuity in job sites. We're not bringing safety people in and and letting them make a relationship and and then keeping them for a for the long term. And and I think that's part of the um, it can be part of the the problem with implementing any of those those solutions. Right. Um, but but that puts a lot of pressure on you, boots in the ground, right? You know, implement this new system. But what what really matters? I guess what really matters in your day to day. It's certainly not the paperwork. Um, I came across a somebody put something on LinkedIn a few months ago back, and it was titled "Sunshine Reporting." And if one of you guys got your computer up, I would it, I would encourage you to look that up. Uh, but it was essentially a long definition talking about the overemphasis on analytics, false analytics particularly, and usually comes from some form of corporate failure or uh, untruth. And I think we're getting, I think we get too lost in the analytics. Uh, it's good to see that, you know, we, we're able to control so many uh, no harm events or near misses. We're able to control so many SIF potential events, you know, it's good, but it seems like all these, all these different applications. If I go out with a checklist that, you know, maybe has 20 different subject in it and each one has 20 different uh, line items to it all of a sudden I've done 300 observations and these companies get lost in seeing, Oh, we've done 30,000 observations in the last month. That's great. Isn't that wonderful? And, and we're getting lost in that stuff. Uh, instead well, what are they of what doing really, about it, right. What are they yeah, doing what, about it? I guess what are they doing what, about it? Right. That's what I, I, I ask. Right. Cause, cause I'm the kind of girl that walks through a, a site and, and I see something and I say something, right. I mean, and I, and I kind of gather that that's James too, like, and, and, and it's you, right. Yeah. Um, and there's a big difference between that and book safety, right? Right. Um, I can make an observation, right? But the paperwork is sec secondary. Um, right. James, you, you well, know I think there's a, a tendency to fall into the routine, the complacency, you know, uh, metrics are important because they give us a way to gauge success. But at the same time, metrics have been around and observations have been around going back into the 1970s. But they're only as good as the people who are putting the data in. Back when I was in school many years ago, they used to call this garbage in, garbage out. And are we getting to the point where we're, we're so paperwork intensive? We need to fill out this, this form. We got to get this form. We got to get this report. We got to get this in that we're missing opportunities to actually interact with the human beings that are doing the job, the folks that have the potential to be injured. Are we, are we missing that? Uh, you know, the last software program I was working with had a, a spot in it to document the near misses. They called it no harm events. Our company did, but it's, it's the same thing. Uh, but you're not just documenting that stuff. It gives you an opportunity to to conduct a full investigation on the event 
And when we talk about proactive safety, that's where I think we're really missing is we're not exploring these no harm events or these near misses. And part of that's because the the near miss tool in itself has been so heavily abused that nobody knows what to do with it. When it starts off with, you know, trying to encourage our guys to report this stuff and it turns into somebody gets in trouble, that'd be the last time they tell you anything. And I, I think that data collection is important, but if you're not going to do anything with it, then it's not important. And but by exploring and, and doing the investigations, then we can assign action items to, to supervision or whoever it is that needs to assign those action items to. But then we're stuck again with are they going to follow through with those action items or are they just going to check the box and say we'll get to it next week? And it, it, that's that really depends on the culture of the company, I think. Um, when we were talking on the phone earlier, I was thinking. What is one of the biggest problems that we've got in the field right now? And Linda, when we first met, it was during the COVID era. So everything was kind of shut down and uh, pay scales went down and things. And I think when we came out of that COVID area, it was like a bomb went off. And next thing you know, there was really big jobs busted out everywhere and you know, jobs requiring lots and lots of contractors. Uh, everything just hit it. And a lot of these companies, you know, where they started off with maybe 500 employees, now they've got 4,000 employees and we and we muffin top the foundation of our cultures. Um, as active as they wanna be and in their hearts, they really wanna do well, but they just can't keep up with it. We've got so many different things going on, so many different moving parts. We've got these small companies and now become large companies. They went from, you know, half million dollar a year companies to, you know, in excess of a billion. They just, they're blooming and they can't keep up with it. And then the people that are running these jobs are some of the, the old hats that are used to doing things a certain way and they're not they're not adapting to the change. And then that's getting left on us, the safety people. We got to be the coach and we got to be the mentors and we got to teach and we got to train. And I'm just one person. I can't fix everybody. Certainly can't fix a 4,000 person operation. Well, I like one of my favorite quotes is by Henry David Thoreau. Way back when. And he said, men have become the tools of their tools. And so I think you need technology and good technology in order to maximize the abilities that you have as a safety professional in the field. Where would we be without the Ford gas monitor? That's technology, right? right. Where would we be without the personal computer? Where would we be without you know, the advances we have in training programs today, they have leveraged technology. But at the same time, if I'm hearing you right, let's don't get so enamored by the technology that we forget it's still safety, still about identifying hazards, determining what risks are, putting controls in place, and getting workers home safe from these hazardous jobs. Oh, man, right. I thought of a great analogy. Can I put it in here? Yeah. So, so, you know, you, I think you, you both know, and I probably anybody who's ever listened to anything that I've ever been on, I talk about the, the human side of safety and talking, talking about like making connections with people and you have to have all those connections. You have to have that, that organizational culture in place, right? That's the block that the lever moves, right? So you can have all the levers you want to move the block, but if you don't have the block to move, to push down the road, right? Or, or to topple over or to, you know, to, uh, you know, pry up. It doesn't matter if you have a four gas monitor. It doesn't matter if you have site docs. It doesn't matter if you have uh, subcontractor. It doesn't matter because because you're just using a lever to move nothing, right? And and so I think technology is great, but but we've gone so far down this road. And I think this is this is again I'm I'm putting words in your mouth, Shane. But this is where we've gone. Is we we've we've overemphasized the levers that we're going to use to make us better. And we're not even making ourselves whole in the first place, right? We're not, right. we're not making a thing to move. Well, I get, Does that make sense? when, when I go through interview process, you know, I get a lot of potential clients ask me, uh, how good are you with, you know, some certain software and sometimes they'll name off one I've used, but at the end of the day, my answer is they all pretty much do the same thing. It's, you know, I'm, I'm smart been I was born into safety during the you know the beginning part of the technological era I guess of, of gathering data doing the the digital observations and stuff so 
I've had my hands on a bunch of them, but they all pretty much do the same thing. So, you know, some of these companies are more fond of, of one than the other or whatever, but they all pretty much do the same thing. It's what are we doing with the data? Mm -hmm. And, you know, to your point of the human part of it, I was on a job last year and it was still pretty green field, uh, but we got to the point where there was going to be a lot more aerial lifts used. And they, for three days, I had to argue with the management about whether or not a spotter is needed. Well, what if the, what if the lift is way over there and they're not around anybody? And I said, what is the primary purpose of the ground person with the, with the lift? Well, they make sure they don't bump into anything. They, and they name off all this different stuff. And I said, you're all incorrect. The primary purpose of that person is to get somebody down if something goes wrong while they're up top. And then all the rest of the stuff is correct answers as well. But the primary function is to get them down. If you've right. got somebody way over there, you got somebody way over there. Yeah, they're not going to bump into anything. The likelihood of something really going wrong is pretty low unless it's something personal or some kind of mechanical failure with the machine. Uh, but still, if they're way over there, how do you get to them? And by the third day, I, I just asked, guys, why do we have to continue arguing about this for three days? The bottom line is, before you send your people out to work, ask yourself, is this the safest way I could be doing it? And if that answer is no, you need to find something else. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was just a lot of nonsense arguing about some really basic stuff. And, and at the end of the day, they weren't willing to to work off of best practice. They It was either in our policy or it was in the regulation, they wanted to see it on paper. And I finally had the, the site superintendent, you know, I, I told him, I've never worked around a group of leaders like this that was this in tune with the company policies. They had everything on on their phone where they could look. You, you'd go and tell them something. First thing they do is bust out the policy, read, show me where it says that. And he told me, you know why that is, right? And I said, why? First of all, so we know what we can do. And second of all, so we know what we can get away with. And wow. that in itself, that in itself spoke volumes to that particular individual. Because see what I can get away with means in terms of a, a class A leader, class B leader, class C leader, you're going to be a C and that's all you're ever going to do. You're going to do the bare minimum, the bottom line of what's required, but you're never going to go out on a limb and say, is this the best decision I can be making? So and you circumvented it, it, my question, Shane. I was going to say, is it is it laziness? Is it is it is it you know thumbing the system? Is it uh, post COVID we don't have enough people to provide um, adequate spotters? Is it? But but really, what you're saying is it it is it's just plain old. I don't care. I don't it's care. It's pretty. But I, I mean, care pretty enough, basic. I care enough to tell you that I know how to not care. Well, That's, right. And I think it's pretty basic. It's, I mean, do you care about these people that are working for you or not? If you cared, you know, you, you would go out of your way to figure out, you know, come talk to me. I, I wasn't going to charge these people a bunch of money. I wasn't going to get into their bonus at the end of the job. I wasn't out here spending a lot of money. A lot of times the, the best answer is the easiest answer. And you just got to put a little effort into it. Sometimes you might have to spend a little bit of money, but I'm not that safety guy that's going to go out and make you spend a hundred thousand dollars on some contraption. It's just going to get used once and thrown back into a connex. I mean, there, there's a whole bunch more answers mm -hmm. to it than that. You know, there's, it's, it's a, it's pretty basic. And I just, I really had a hard time with that leadership team just because they wouldn't do it. And, you know, some of these guys have worked in certain powerhouses and refineries, you know, building on expansions or something like that. And there the, the rules are, are really rigid. What really bothers me is when you come into an environment where the rules aren't quite as rigid, and it's like none of that stuff ever even happened. It all yeah, goes out the window. That's, that's been my experience too. You know, uh, coming from the oil and gas industry, we have rules, we have policies, we have enforcement mechanisms. Uh, whether you're working downstream, midstream, or upstream, but once you get into some more of these general industry type verticals. Man, is I, I, I say this all the time. It's we got challenges in oil and gas use, but man, it's like we're 25 years ahead of some of these other industries in hazard identification and controls. It's like it's 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 foreign. Is is that been your experience? It's I don't know about that, but when you switch from from construction to general industry, if I just if I took a job tomorrow and marched straight into some manufacturing plant. 
what I've seen there is somewhere along the way, somebody spent a whole bunch of money on getting some, you know, high cost consultant or something came in there and, and created these big policies and stuff. Hey man, watch I that. Like That's me, bro. Well, but, <laughs> but somewhere along the line, somebody spent some money on a you or a Linda. And now that they've spent that money, it's that way for now and forevermore. I like uh, Sam Goodman's book. He talked about stacking rules on top of rules on top of rules, and then nobody goes back and clears out the old stuff and see what's relevant anymore. That section of the plant may not even be running anymore. And, and they just get lost in it. They spent so much money. But the flip side of that is you get safety people that come in. Look, I'm not gonna, I, I'm not gonna sell myself as a safety director at this point. Um, I, I would consider myself mid-level management at best. Uh, but these folks, now that you've been a manager for a little while, in my mind, I tell myself, oh, I could be a director. I could do what you do. And they end up spending all this different money with these plants. <clears throat> and at best, they make lateral moves. But seldom does it ever amount to being anything advanced or uh, anything like that for the better good. It just ends up being lateral moves. And they want to make you know, safety people, we want to make all these different changes, we immediately walk into a place and see all the stuff wrong. And we immediately want to make all these changes and ideas cost money most of the time. But you got to ask yourself, is this going to further advance the system? Or is it just a lateral move? And these companies get tired of spending money. Good safety people come in and they get shut down because their ideas aren't much different than anybody else's ideas were. And then we give up, we walk mm -hmm. away and, and, and it makes it makes a plant go from, you know, we started in 1950 and now it's 2024 and we still got 1950 rules going on. And at the end of the day, the part nobody ever wants to say out loud, I don't care how many posters and signs and quotes they got on their wall, production's the bottom line. Get the stuff out the door. Yeah. I don't, I don't mind that. You know, I'm, I'm fond of say, saying this to, to people. Safety is not number one. <clears throat> my product I'm not producing is safe, right? It's right. not. It's whatever product and services that we're selling. I mean, I'm a safety consultant. I guess you could say my product is is safety. But for everybody else, whatever product they're generating is is necessary for the viability of the company. So to say safety is number one uh, is a misnomer. But I'll say this. Good companies, forward-thinking companies, companies that understand uh, have safety at least as equal to production and quality. Because you show me a company right. that has bad safety, I'll show you a company that's got production delays. I'll show you a company that's got quality issues. I'll show you a company with cost overruns. So they all kind of work together within the system. And, you know, I'm, I've gotten in trouble for my views on safety culture and Dr. Wait, Martin's what? views on safety Wait, culture. Uh -huh. You in trouble? No, all you? the time. You can't be Come a safety on. outlaw if you don't get in a little bit of trouble, right? The safety right? outlaw club. So I like challenging the status quo, and I think everybody on this call likes to challenge the status quo. Sure. But one of my big, I guess, thought processes around changing terminology from safety culture to organizational culture is when we say safety culture, then that puts it back on you, Shane. Right. Okay. When we say organizational culture of which safety is part of that, then it's not so silo. It's equal with everything that we do. And I don't have a big philosophical debate about safety culture. And if people want to use that term, I'm not going to go off on those people or think bad about those people, you know, but I think when we silo things in safety without looking at it as an integral part of the overall organization, that's how we end up in situations where, you know, safety people don't fully appreciate the business aspects necessary to, to, to keep our company viable. We don't know how to talk uh, to business leaders. We don't understand and can't communicate ROI. So there are a lot of things that go in, I think, as a safety profession we can improve upon. And I want to get your reaction to this. Are we closing the gap between uh, the folks who plan the work and the folks do the work? Or are we widening the gap? In other words, 
I don't know if we're what I've been experiencing in the last couple of years. I don't know if we're doing either one. I think there's just gaps. Uh, I think there's walls. Uh, to your point about safety, quality, productivity, uh, I think there's walls in between all. My the last job site I was on in in Georgia, I shared an office with the with the quality folks, <clears throat> and I shared with them something. A company I worked for a couple of years ago, and uh, I know this isn't the platform to be dropping names out and stuff, but um, during my onboarding process, I had to go to all the department heads and introduce myself, and they introduced themselves to me. But when I got to the senior uh, senior director over quality, he shared with me something that before he took over the company, they had some six digit number worth of rework every year they were having to do, and when he when he discussed this idea of culture, you see the circular pattern of safety, arrow to quality, arrow to productivity, arrow to safety. You got to thinking about that. And just like you said, you could have a company that's got all the production, but quality and safety fail. Now you're going back and reworking. We killed somebody, somebody got real bad hurt. We didn't make any money on that job. Yeah. You can add the the productivity and the quality to it, but we still had somebody die or still somebody had to get got really bad hurt you can't or, sit on a three-legged stool with two legs right right so yeah. to shorten the whole thing up you know when he took that to the owner of the company the owner of the company spread this word out to everybody and he shared his expectations with everybody all the levels of leadership he didn't want to have any any of those three things you have quality and safety but you come in six months behind schedule you're still losing money right um, you know, there's there's a there's a lot of things that go on with that, and that company really embraced that to their overall culture. And you know, the leadership they weren't going to let their guys go out and do crazy stuff. The safety wasn't going to go out and let anybody do crazy stuff. We were able to collaborate with each other, and one of their core values was at the leadership level. You're sitting in a conference room with with ten different people. We all collaborated with each other. It, mm. it meant something. One voice by the time it was over, and and everybody understood. And and I thought that was probably one of the most profound conversations I ever had with anybody at a at an upper level leadership. Um, and I've carried that with me for the last couple of years, except that I walked into a company that is muffin top. Like I said in the beginning of this, they went from a you know thousand a thousand people in their company to now they're at forty five hundred people in their company, and they they really want it. But they're not doing it. And and I had a friend of mine point something out to me. Maybe they don't know how to do it. Maybe they don't know how to come back to the you know, I was I was describing communication gaps from the upper level leadership to the executive level, particularly to the owner. And the bottom line was maybe they didn't know how to say something to them. And that might be the case. I don't know. Bottom line is they hired me to manage safety, not to manage the whole organization. That's a hard thing to do when you care. Is you know I'm not there to manage the whole organization. I can't change all that stuff, but nobody else is changing it either. And that's why I said I think that we're not we're neither closing nor opening the gaps. They're just gaps. And I'm wondering if people just don't know how to overcome those gaps. Well, I'd like to think a lot of things are due to lack of understanding, knowledge, experience, as opposed to I don't care. There, there's not a safety management system ever been designed for I don't care, right? right. At any level. At any that's, level. That's why I said and they don't know. And I, you know, I listen to you guys, various podcasts or whatever, and when I listen to you guys, you know what you know and you don't know what you don't know. That's the problem. When you don't know what you don't know, you're also not willing to admit, I don't know. And that's right. the thing that I see on the field. Um, what was that thing I, I sent you the other day, Linda, that says, ignorance begets confidence more often than knowledge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you know, I'm going to go back to this, right? It takes everybody to build something, okay? And, and, you know, I, I've got my It Depends, and James loves that. I knew you were fixing to say that. He stole, he stole my It Depends. He's going to steal this analogy now. But, you know, if, if you build it, they will come. You can't move. You can't shape. You can't, you can't change. You can't improve something you do not have. Okay? 
And so we're bringing in a consultant, bringing in a new safety guy, firing an old safety guy, uh, you know, interchanging the parts. That's not going to work until we, until everybody decides, right? Or management tells everybody they must do it, and they get rid of the ones who don't want to do it. And you build something to move, shape, push, change, improve, etc. Right? And there's no software in the world that's going to do it. There's no. It, it's just not right. It takes people. Well, I've been asked that interview for. I was interviewing for a safety management position for a plant, and they said, "Well, you know, there might be times when the president of the company, the vice president of the company, comes. I might have to talk about what are you going to do." Dude? And I answered to them, said, "What are they going to talk about them?" You would think if they if they actually cared about the safety and well-being of their people, they would want to talk about regular people. Right. Uh, so, you know, each, each person puts their pants on on one leg at a time. Right. It's not that big of a deal. It's when folks get scared because the president's in them or, or whoever's coming. Them. If they really cared, you think they want to come over and talk to them. Well, I think one thing is being a, a, a senior leader in an organization. I've been CEO of something ever since the late 1990s. And I came out of operations and executive management. And the, the one thing that I, I think all senior leaders have to understand is. is the higher up you go in your organization, the less you really know what's going on. Okay. When I was in the military, we did this all the time. The admiral's coming up, so we're, we're hiding stuff, we're putting storerooms, we're cleaning stuff up. You know, that's not the way it looked the day before they had a game, and it's not going to the way it looked the day after they had a game. So we're not getting to see the reality. And I think if I had any advice to, to the field today, like folks, and to your senior management, Get out of your office and go to the process. Talk to the people who do the job. Talk to people like Shane that are managing safety at the end of the, at the, at the end of the sphere, right? Yeah, the sphere here. At the tip of the sphere here. Because I can create you a very nice safety management system. Looks like a little way paper. But if it's not being effective, if you can't implement it, if it's, if it's, if it's a void of reality, we're actually not helping. We're making things work for us. We're right. right. making right. things work for us. So, Just uh, looking around the field, I think a lot of the, a lot of changes are could be more verbal behavioral based changes than the monetary or project. You know, you know, this is going to be a nine month deal or, or a three week shutdown. Down and eight days. But most of the time, the stuff is verbal in a in a working plant. What are you going to do to get the guys out on the floor when they're coming around the corner or going up in other sections? That's verb. That's not a guy got to buy a drop down the floor for a or get a new contract right now. Right 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 that's all our verb. But if they're, they're not going to do it, it, then what? what? And then that's, that's really, really probably the biggest struggle. These things are going to be able to get out of the field. Like you said, in the military, every year we're coming. Exactly. I don't know. 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 I don't and it's fairly told me that uh, they were they were prepared for the president, the vice president, the doing tour, and there was all these people, you know, know the IDP, whatever, whatever. So they spent a week week repainting the lines on the floor, or they they were still in and still doing their process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The guy, yeah, guy yeah. made him talk to the roller roller. First thing he said is, "Wait, I'll be able to do it." Oh no, no, no. He said, "No, no, 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 no." Because you can look around and see all the fresh paint everywhere, and there's all sorts of shit. You can't get any fresh paint. Fresh paint smells well, but you're dirty. You'll feel the impact of water out there. It's simple, but he's just looking at it. Y'all ain't always rolling at it. That's how old we feel. We only have a lot of bottom rolls off. I'm not running. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, that's what I was going Some CFs, as if, 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 as
always. But this is a free friend right, right now. You hear what we all talk about. about let's let's focus, focus on, on the stuff that, that, that heals, heals you. And, 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 and I'm not somewhat agree with that a little bit. But is, is that, that really feel for a balance at a level? Or are we just, just talking, talking about, about it? Or are we going to go? Are we having any significant changes change as that? At, at the past level, that's, level, that's, that's going, going to reduce your serious injuries and biopsies. Well, um, well, you know, we always work with, we have a program called, called Atlanta Lex. And Atlanta Lex is one of those city based uh, deals that they were never going to uh, organizational culture change. They really want to focus on the tips. As they say, people, people we've all, all heard, and I can say on top. Oh, well, they, they built this program in a way that was around our archive in the past, and they had a real period of time, and they, they, they evaluated what that task for people to rehearse. That's how they identified by those high risk tasks. What I saw from the, the, the data collection side of it, and looking at analytics, is our guys didn't want to go out and well tell on each other. In order to do that, you got to write, you got to go, not necessarily evaluate your own three groups, you have to go evaluate other groups. So, so nobody, nobody's going to go out there and tell each other. Nobody's, nobody's going to tell on their own group. And we had, had one of our one of, one of our checklists was the work area. So if you fall, step in the walkway, and things like that, that became a catch-all resort. Somebody, somebody didn't want to do their required amount of SIF observation in a week. They, they just drop it in the work area. And, and essentially, they're becoming their own safety cop. We, we, we intentionally didn't have a PPE section in, in, in the observation checklist because there were some, 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 some high risk tasks that required certain PPE, but we didn't want to have, to have a whole category of love and class hard hard hats. I learned that even, even as a consultant, I could fly into a job site right across the whole place for 30 minutes and write down all these different, you know, I saw some three people without glasses on, 12 people without gloves on, you know. That doesn't require any real thought that it doesn't require any problem solving skills and it really doesn't even require any interaction. It's like I just walked through and checked off a whole bunch of boxes and ran out. But did I fix anything? No. I was walking up and said, hey, buddy, what do you got going on here? Talk to him for a little bit. He did get human with him for a little bit. And then talk to him about what they're doing wrong and how they can impact you. Again, I don't know. This is that terminology has become new to me in the last about two and a half years or so. I, I can't get the high risk care management debunked. I don't know to get that, but I still do believe that the little thing will build up and it eventually become big things. And if enough of those little things go on, eventually they do become big things. But, but I, I, I agree with that, Shane. And let me say it this way you, you cannot focus entirely on SIFs if you don't, you don't have a mature safety management system that's taking care of the things you're talking about right now. Right. Okay. SIF is just pretty rare. Is it a safety it's management rare. system, though, or is it a, a production management system? Okay. No, you know, that's, that's why I said I don't think we're closing our way. We have 6,000 people, 5,000, 6,000 people that perish in the workplace every year, and, and that's horrible. It, it is. And, and, and frankly, it makes me angry because most of them can be prevented, right? right? But from that standpoint, compared to the actual number of people that are working every day, it's pretty statistically low. And, and I think there's a tendency now to say, and it's trendy, we're not going to, we're going to start worrying about compliance. We're not going to worry about whether they wear the safety glasses. We're not going to worry about their, their PPE. We're just going to focus on the stuff that, that kills you, okay? Well, would it not lead up to that if we don't take care of these fundamental things that are in safety? You know, I understand what you're saying. The, 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 message out out is, the message comes out is, the message comes out is, I don't have to do this anymore. And that's the yeah. one. That, Nobody's going to say anything anyway, so it, it doesn't matter if I do this anymore. So it's not, I don't believe that that's a safety management system. I believe that's a production management system. We, we we are dictating, when I say we, it doesn't necessarily mean us, but it is being dictated, do I have to do this or do I not have to do this anymore? Right. right. Are they looking or are they not looking? That's why I think before you can get to a, if you're going to get to a SIF focused safety management system, you still have to have something to build off of because those little things matter. Now, yeah. Jimmy, 
twist twist on his ankle and ending up at the emergency room tonight is, is not going to keep me up uh, awake tomorrow, right? But that doesn't mean I'm going to be satisfied that I, I got ten Jimmies out there twisting their ankles and ending up at the at the hospital. You know, it's yeah. a big business to begin with, and it's not focused on worker health. So I, we in safety tend to jump on these trends a lot. Whatever's trendy. Whatever. Well, I had somebody I, I had somebody share with me a couple of months ago his thoughts on this and the idea of we had a we had a minor little first aid or we had a big first aid. No, you just had a first aid. We had a minor little injury or we had a big injury. No, you just had an injury. And the bottom line is it's not okay with anybody to be getting hurt. And to categorize these things as you know, small, medium or large incidents is uh is incorrect and it's it goes on out in the field it goes on in the world of safety it goes on everywhere it depends on how much i want to how deeply do i want to dive into an investigation how many action items do i want to put out on somebody how many are they willing to take over and so we start saying oh we had a minor little thing but it was no big deal uh, you know i know we're going to run out of time here for a minute but i wanted to share something out loud three weeks ago i had a young man had three fingers cut off. And before that, last year, I had an older gentleman got his arm smashed between a 65,000 pound load. Mm. I was out of state before I got to that job site. Uh, but the safety coordinator that was working with me, he called me almost every day after that man got his arm smashed. And I kept telling him, you got to find some place to put that. You, you can't let it haunt you like that. Find some place to put it. And the amount of stuff that I carry around with me individually, the fatalities and the gruesome injuries, I've, I'm lucky enough to have found some place to put that. But three weeks ago, when that young man got his fingers cut off, something happened. I was the one there. I was the one there with him. I was with his, with his wife. His family was there. And the young man hadn't been wearing gloves. So I'm looking at his paw in the air. He's got ga gauze around where they were trying to stop the bleeding. And the first thing I noticed was his hands were black. He's a mechanic. And I told his I told his wife, when they take him to surgery, the first thing they're gonna have to do is, is scrub those hands. And that's gonna be something that he never forgets. And of course they put him under and all that. So he probably didn't feel that. But what he did feel is when he came back around. And right. they rolled him out of they rolled him out of a uh, surgery. I was sitting in the waiting room of the ICU and he was still under a little bit. It was about 20 minutes later. The nurses came in and said, you can go in and see him. He's awake now. And when I walked in that room, that young man was in so much discomfort. I mean, feet wiggling, toe. I could feel it in my toenails how bad he was hurting. And this flood of emotions came out. And then that's when the thoughts really occurred to me that when somebody gets hurt, more of the time than not, it's a safety professional that had to escort him to the hospital. It's a safety person that had to take him there. The safety person's having to call the family. The safety person's having to comfort the family it's the safety person that gets to see this person when he comes out of surgery it's sometimes there's supervision there but most of the time it's a safety person and it, i mean this this flood of emotions hit me and when i came back to the plant to share with the groups the first second and third shift i told them i i can tell you this story as colorful as possible but you weren't standing there to see that young man and, and see the discomfort he was in and, and like I said, I could feel it in my toenails how bad he was hurting. And that that had a more profound effect on me than any other thing that I've seen in my career. And I don't know why. Um, just maybe it's just because of the amount of stuff that I've learned over the years. I don't know. But the way that the emotions hit me this time was was a lot different. And to see a company that just doesn't care. Well, we got him back to work. We got away from the lost time. We didn't have as many lost time days. Uh, all these different things that companies do. If they spend as much time trying to actually prevent the recordable injuries as they do trying to figure out ways to get out of them, it'd be a lot better situation out in the field. Amen. I told I told Amen. a guy one time he 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 wouldn't he wouldn't just come out and say it. He was beating around the bush, so I just said it for him. I said, "What you're asking is the wrong question. You're asking mm -hmm. me how do I cover up my recordable." When you should be asking, why do I keep getting my people hurt? Right. And in this in this case, you know, I really had to figure out 
what went wrong and what can we do different? And then it occurred to me that with this, you know, I'll go back to what we started off with, with this boom in the industries, money everywhere, big jobs everywhere. We got to, we have a lot of shade tree craftsmen out there, a lot of shade tree laborers, a lot of shade tree craftsmen. They don't know, uh, you know, in this day and age, people just can't afford to go to school and go to work at the same time and, and take care of their families. You have to do one thing or the other. I mean, your plate has to be clean if you're going to be in school mm. and even trade school. I mean, it's, it's hard to keep up with this stuff if you're trying to work and go to school at the same time. So training isn't the answer. I, I mean, what am I supposed to train this young man on? What he should have done was take loose the bolts of that electric motor and slid it forward. That would have took more time. But what he really did is what he saw somebody else do. And probably that person that he saw do it has done it a thousand times that way. Did it wrong. But what are you supposed to do? And you just can't. That was a third shift guy. It happened at one o'clock in the morning. You can't have upper management there at one o'clock in the morning. Uh, I mean, what no, really what you can do you have do? processes and you can have procedures and you can audit those processes. And that sometimes becomes what the safety professional ends up having to do when reality. Yeah. There, there's not enough of us, Shane. There's really there's not. not. So somebody emailed me last week uh, from University of Kentucky, and they asked me, what's the ratio of safety professionals to folks in the field? And I said, you know, this is kind of anecdotal. I haven't done a lot of empirical research, on that, but here's the thing. <laughs> Anywhere between 50 to 100 employees per safety professional. I've seen it even yeah. Or more, or, or more. more. You, you, can, you can feature it like uh, jailers to inmates is pretty much the same. You get one or two safety professionals per hundred. That's plus a good employees. analogy. That's yeah, a good analogy. Inmates. So the ratio is overwhelming. So it can't be my job as a safety professional. You know, I can audit the process, but safety has to be an integral portion of operations. So if I was doing that investigation, at some point, I would look at, hey, this design of this process, do we have a process or is it in everybody's head? Because I think one of the reasons that you're seeing uh, SIF rates go up is because as we've gone through this generational change, for whatever reason, we didn't have a process. We had it in everybody's head. So when those people left, they left with our process. And... You know, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of Fred Manuel, and I say it all the time. Hazards are best controlled in the planning and design of the work. One phase of work. Okay. <laughs> and the worker's role in that, in that illustration, you know, a lot of people would come back and they'd blame the kid. and They'd say, you shouldn't have done this. You shouldn't have done that. But, you know, Dr. Reason probably said it best. That worker's role was the final garnish to a lethal brew that had been long in the cooking. Now, Yep. When when you're talking to somebody that lives in Louisiana about lethal brews and cooking, that, that sort of resonates with me, right? But it still yep. goes back to, hey, safety is not and cannot be just the safety professional's job. So as we're coming down, there's a lot of tools that we can use uh, from a technological standpoint to get data, to be able to analyze data, but it's still coaching, empowering, letting operations understand, production understand, I'm just one person, bro. I need you to embrace this and that safety be part of your total management system, your organizational culture, and not just something that I do yeah. and I check the book. Well, even during COVID, uh, you know, I argued that safety people became the mask police. We have so much stuff to, to worry about in the field during a big project especially during a quick turnaround or something, I'm not going to spend my whole day worrying about putting masks on. I, it wasn't something that I was wholeheartedly sold on to begin with. And there's no way I could go out onto a place and, and try to convince 300 people, put your mask on and it's got to be all the way above your nose and below your mouth. There's, there's other things that have to happen better. Uh, but we became one person trying to implement everything. Mm -hmm. A good friend awesome. of mine likes to, Go ahead. A good friend of mine likes to point out the generational gaps, and I think that's what you were just alluding to a, a few minutes ago was these gaps in knowledge. You know, uh, you know, Linda, when I, you and I spoke the first time, I was talking about you have the young to mid twenties age group, and then it jumps up to the 
mid thirties, early forties age group. And then it jumps again into like the, the late fifties, sixties age group. And in between there, you got 10 or 15 years in between generations lost. And right. Everybody just standing there looking up, hoping they can be as good as the next person one day. And the people at the top, they're ready to go. They're ready to be done with this. They're not wanting to teach. They're not wanting to, you know, for, for years, they've always had to be teaching somebody and you get a bunch of knuckleheads in the field that don't want to learn or think they know everything. And there's, there's serious gaps out in the field. Well, I mean, I guess that's, I don't know if that's what we were looking for. I, I think, I think we knew that's what you were going to say, Shane. Yeah. Um, always, always a great time hearing your wisdom from the field, because I know I don't get in the field as much as I used to. I know James doesn't. Um, I just, I, I want to make a final comment here that I always like to sneak it. It depends um, into the conversation. James, James has his two quotes that he says every time that that are his hallmark quotes and he said those and so do you have anything to add to that Shane do you have a do you have a famous famous last words quote for us uh, no, I don't think I have a famous last words quote maybe next time we speak I'll have something in my pocket for it but uh I, I really enjoyed that message I gave you a couple of weeks ago that ignorance begets confidence more often than knowledge and it's just a uh, you know what you know let's and you don't know what you don't know that's right let's not be ignorant let's learn Let's learn. Let's make something so that we can move it. So that was a Charles Darwin quote, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, Shane, thanks again for coming on the Risk Matrix. I'm going to let uh, James take us out. James. Thank you to all of our with listeners that, that join us on a weekly basis. Please follow us on YouTube and on Spotify. If you're on the YouTube channel, these drop every Tuesday sometime around lunch. Hit that like button, smash that subscribe button on both YouTube and Spotify so you can be notified when the next episode of The Risk Matrix is available. Thank you, Shane, for joining us and for your passion at getting workers home safe. And all of y'all keep getting these workers home safe from these high-hazard jobs.